Marshawn Sager here. Welcome back to The Realignment. I'm on the road and Sagar is about to go on the road himself. So for this start of our season, we decided we would do one last big Q&A episode. It's been one of the favorite parts of the podcast. For both of us, we're going to start exploring a different format for bringing the audience into the show starting in September to October. So considering we had a bunch of submitted questions and the relaunch of the newsletter, this was the perfect time to do this. So huge thank you to Lincoln Network. Check out the Substack. You all know the deal. Let's get into the question. This first question is a good one because it's meta, a word that people say, I say all the time. Hey guys, love the show. I'm curious about each of y'all's process for preparing for guests. You've referenced articles, audiobooks, etc. But how do you pick and choose content so that you're well prepared on the right topics? Also, my fiction recommendation, Dark Matter by B- by Blake Crouch. Excellent sci-fi novel. Love the work y'all do across shows. Keep it up. Best. Cole H. Sager, how do you prep? Yeah, it's a great question. I think really what it is, is there's a simultaneous, if it's a guest that I don't know that much about, it might be looking at the most recent thing that they've read. Obviously, if they have a book, like learn, don't necessarily always have time to read the book or read a much of like read as much of it as I can. But honestly, really living this job breaking points and more, I just always have to be in it. So if I reference something, it's usually because that's just something I encounter from my day-to-day life in terms of reading articles, in terms of reading books that I was already going to read anyways. If I reference news events and more, it's because I remain plugged in because that's my job in order to make sure that I bring it to everybody else. So it's a little bit of prep and it's a little bit of just being me. What about you, Marshall? Yeah, my favorite quote on this topic comes from Sonal Chokshi. She leads the A16Z podcast, which is a great podcast in the start venture, in the startup venture capital space. Her line on this is that life is prep. So if you're the type of person like Sagar and I, where this is pretty much all you do, we have four podcasts and TV shows between us. So we're hyper focused on talking to people, talking about ideas. So this isn't really a matter of waking up and saying, okay, time to read this big book or time to do this, 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 or that. We generally just spend a lot of time reading, a lot of time listening. I listen to around two to three podcasts a day. I'll listen to a book a week. I'll read another paperback book a week. And these books will be done around the topics we're interested in. So at one point, I'll be reading Robert Draper's book about the war in Iraq. Another week, I will be reading about the history of NBC. So I could talk about television when we get to that a little later in the summer. So we can get to that a little later in the season. So a good way just to sum this up, look at our bookshop list. We actually do a large amount of work of putting together something that will make you a pretty strong generalist on all these different topics. To the next question, this one is from Austin W. Hey guys, longtime fan, first time caller. What are your guys' thoughts on the role of the judiciary in modern America? FDR famously wrote in his fireside chats that the Supreme Court ought not to act as a super legislature. However, that seems to be a the very function of the court today. From abortion to unions, it seems that all issues are thrown out to the court to decide through substantive due process instead of our legislators, you know, legislating. Should the court act like a super legislature while our legislature is inept, so that's captured by corporate interests? Or should the court reject that role and put the ball back into Congress's court to hopefully encourage some actual legislating on difficult issues? Yeah, I think that's a hard question, but honestly, I think you're getting the roles reversed here. It's not the court's job in order to tell Congress to act. It's the people's job in order to tell Congress to act. And ultimately, look, a lot of people say that they don't like Congress, but a lot of people like their individual legislature. And so there's a lot of interlocking problems that we have to fix. But I think that the diagnosis of the issue is probably pretty sound, which is that the issue we have is that the Senate in particular, doesn't want to do anything. They don't want to take hardline or difficult votes on any cultural issue whatsoever, so they punt it up to the Supreme Court, or they engineer it such that the battles over those issues get confined to one Supreme Court nomination, maybe per president, and then the court itself has to act on that. But at the end of the day, it's not the court's job to absolve itself of responsibility. It's the people's job to get some responsibility and make the people that they elect actually do something about it. How you actually do all of that, 
I don't know. We have a lot of different episodes. I think that we talked to Lee Drutman. That may be one that you could go and take a look at. Rank choice voting. There's a lot of different ways that you can change the way that the democracy itself functions. But outside of the current system, um, I think we're locked into this for a while, unfortunately. What do you think, Marshall? No offense, co-host, and no offense to the questioner, but I actually disagree with a bit of Sagar's answer and disagree with the premise. So firstly, about where I disagree with Sagar, I don't think it's true that the Senate just doesn't want to take responsibility for issues. I think if you took Democrats and if you gave the Democrats a really stable majority from people who represent most Democrats' views on policy issues, they would take all sorts of stands on all sorts of issues. If you gave a Senate full of AOCs, you'd have a Green New Deal. If you had a Senate full of socially liberal blue staters, you would have Roe v. Wade more constitutionally protected in the court. The reason then why we don't have issues, actually, decisions actually made by Congress is there is no actual consensus on these big issues. There is no actual consensus position on abortion in this country. So it's not that Congress is saying, hmm, we could make this decision on these really complicated issues. We're just not going to do it. No, it's because there actually isn't a real coalition capable of doing that. It's not as if Congress is saying, oh, we don't want to do anything about student loan debt or we don't want to do anything about financial reform. It's actually that there isn't a coalition of Democrats or Republicans that could push that through. So I think what we're really seeing is during times when there is no consensus in our society, when there aren't politicians who are actually good at coming up with some new formulation or new set of coalitions that can move the ball a different way, you're going to see things get punted to the court. Not because anyone is purposely doing that, not because of corporate interests like Austin suggested, but just because there isn't actually a consensus position. When you do see consensus positions, aka what's passed the CARES Act, you saw the CARES Act actually happen, regardless of whether or not people have beef with it. Next question. This is from Justin. Hey, Marshall and Sager, big fan of the show, and you've really broadened a lot of my perspectives listening along each week. One question that I've been wondering about is, how did the U.S. go from being generally supportive of big government under FDR to essentially despising it under Reagan? As someone on the left, I'm sympathetic to the take that a lot of this has to do with the racialized image of who benefits from government programs after the civil rights era. I haven't heard much of a counter narrative from the right that addresses this. What are your perspectives on additional explanations for this? Thanks, Justin. There's a lot that's packed into that question. Race is obviously a component of the answer. But actually, if you read Matthew Stoller's book, Goliath, who we've had on the podcast multiple times, what he actually talks about, though, is that you see an erosion both in the effectiveness of the post-New Deal democratic state, but also, frankly, even before Reagan, you start to see a new consensus around the ability of the private sector to act within the U.S. economy and to act differently. So really, it actually gets back to what Marshall was saying previously, and I thought it was a very good answer, something I hadn't even considered, which is that, yeah, the thing is, is that the consensus changed. Now, the reason for the consensus changing, there's a whole lot that goes into that. But Vietnam is certainly part of the answer. Mass loss of institutional trust, huge crime wave that happened in the 1960s stratification of society that began to happen with the separation of wealth inequality. There was also the inflation crisis. There's a lot to say about what exactly went into all of this. But the thing is, is that the post-New Deal state, 1948, 1948 in particular, really was kind of that break point with Harry Truman and more. You saw the consensus begin to have a brittle outer shell. Eisenhower comes in, he squares old conservatism, declares peace on the New Deal, but ultimately ushers in a new era. Kennedy comes in, and that's where you really begin to see everything completely drift apart. So really what I would say is that a new consensus formed in America for a variety of complicated reasons that you really can't wrap your head around unless you look at a multifaceted issue, and I don't think race is the only single one. Yeah, perfect answer that I totally agree with. Race obviously is going to affect or infect everything in this type of question. So let's put that to the side. I would really just build on Sagar's historical point here, which is that it's really hard to make the case for big government after Watergate. 
after you see just trust in big institutions collapse, trust in media, trust in politicians, trust in political parties, trust in local institutions, everything like that. The problems that you're seeing government confront after the 1970s are just totally different than the actual issues that government was confronting in the 1930s. And to make this point clear, there's a reason why Republicans haven't overturned those quote unquote big government decisions that were made in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. No one's trying trying to overturn Medicaid. No one's trying to overturn Medicare. No one's trying to overturn Social Security because when government was confronting those set of issues, those were ones that there was enough trust, that the benefits were clear enough and you could actually move forward that way. But moving into the 70s when you start seeing problems like inflation, a failed war, well, the war on poverty thing is complicated, but a war on poverty that doesn't meet expectations when it comes to their lofty rhetoric and the ambition of the LBJ administration, you just have to see a totally different context. So that's a really important thing to do, way to bring the history into it. And a quick recommendation from Justin, we should check out Lily Geismer, who wrote, Don't Blame Us, Suburban Liberals and the Transformation of the Democratic Party. It seems a little <laughs> academic, but that definitely seems like the type of book which is going to be right up the alley of a bunch of our people. Next question, this one is from John P. My question is, how much can local government affect how major corporations treat workers, communities, and the environment when where they build plants and warehouses? I'm thinking mainly about Amazon as I ask this question, but I imagine it applies to other corporations as well. Amazon is about to open a new automated warehouse where I live, Waco, Texas, and while it I think it will boost the local economy and the local state and government to the lobster to bring them here. I'd rather not see members of my community work for three years only to get forced out so they can hire another group of workers to work there under a false premise of upward mobility. Love the show. Keep it up. Thanks, guys. Yeah, actually, this is a good question. It's actually something that can significantly have an impact. Uh, with respect to Amazon, I believe, I could be getting my history wrong here, but part of the whole Fight for 15 movement was specifically about changing the law to $15 an hour in the city of Seattle. Now, from Seattle, from Washington, where Amazon was headquarters, that created a disparity in their national wide wages, and then Bernie Sanders introduced the Stop Bezos Act, which would have required Amazon to pay 15, and Amazon voluntarily did so. The same thing actually happened with Amazon and state and local taxes, which is that for a long time, Amazon didn't want to pay state and local taxes or collect that on its website. A variety of state governments, local governments, they put in different ordinances saying that actually Amazon was required to do that. Amazon went through all this legal buffoonery in order to try and avoid it. And at the end of the day, they just said, okay, you know what? The pressure's mounting. Screw it. We're going to comply. So look, on the micro level, maybe it's not going to have the outsize impact that you want. But on the macro, if enough state and localities come together and decide that they want to change policy, you actually can have a pretty significant impact. I think the problem comes in when Sagar brings up the localities could come together point, because that's the whole broader race to the bottom dynamic that you see happen. So for example, New York City doesn't have HQ2 from Amazon happen in Queens. Well, guess what happens? DC and Virginia specifically were more than happy to pick up the slack and create jobs in that region. So what you're going to see is a situation where states and localities can obviously pass minimum wage requirements, health and safety requirements, all these different policies, but there is going to be a certain point where policies could hypothetically go too far, and you're going to see a situation where another locality would be more than willing to underbid whatever another locality is doing. Amazon and these other corporations are very aggressive about encouraging and discovering those localities, so you have something complicated happen. AKA, this is why we have a federal government. That is why there is a federal minimum wage. That is why there are federal bureaucracies, which despite whatever things we can dunk on them, really exist at their best to prevent there from being a race to the bottom there. So just really important to consider that it's good for state and localities to act, but there is just a hard limit. And there is actually a lot of competition that goes on that frames all of that. John also adds that uh, Sagar, every Thursday I commute from Bryan, Texas, and often listen to breaking points as I'm passing the George W. Bush president presidential library. And I hope you enjoy the irony of that as much as I do. <laughs> I enjoy it well, man. I've made that drive many times. This next question is from Sam W. Greetings, big fan of the podcast. You created an informative yet still accessible format, and I really appreciate all of that. No offense, there's a lot of douches in your various movements, and you guys are not among them. Thank you. We appreciate the compliment. 
Here is the question. I grew up around GOP politics, aka as a fourth grader, I wore a I'm a dole man t-shirt on my own volition. Despite going to art school and my years of living in the intoxicatingly liberal Brooklyn milieu, I still consider myself a conservative. I struggle with the contemporary Republican Party and of conservative politics, though. I'm the target audience for conservatism. I'm married, I'm a middle-class professional, I work in a unionized shop, I'm an evangelical, and I'm even the deacon of my church. Yet, I still don't buy my party's bullshit. My question is, what can people like me do? I live in Queens, so running for office isn't on the table, and I suspect the same is true of many of your listeners in urban America. So, how can we affect change and have a more reasonable Republican Party that's capable of governing, or is that just an even less acidic conversation? Well, I would ask you, what does the Republican Party have to do with your life? Um, And look, maybe that is a charged question. And so, Sam, really what I would say is, if I'm somebody like you, actually, I literally am somebody like you here in D.C., what I have to do is grapple with, am I going to side with the center left or the far left? Now, what I would encourage you to do is to find people who you may even somewhat agree with, whether, whether it comes to masks and schools crime, somebody like Eric Adams or more, and try to push the best of what you can, which is actually going to govern the majority of the policies around your life, because that's probably going to have the majority impact in terms of the day-to-day, in terms of how you're going about it. In the macro, now, I think that's an interesting question. What can an individual person do? Obviously, we have the vote, but I think really what we're beginning to see here is that Republican politicians are becoming media stars because they know that that is the best way in order to become famous and get votes in a national political contest. So what can you do? Well, you could try and give attention to the people who you think that it is worthy of, because that is what the current incentive structure looks like right now. So those are my two twin pieces of advice. Yeah, my piece of advice is really what Sagar said. The answer is, if you live in New York City, if you live in Washington, D.C., if you live in a bunch of places, you should recognize that the way you're going to have influence, the way you're going to make a difference is not going to be by self-identifying as a conservative or trying to become the local precinct committee person in the moribund Manhattan GOP. The answer is much again, like what Sagar said. There's a lot of voters who are frankly like you. They are not conservative. They don't identify as such, but they are people who are not exactly down for whatever the Democratic Party is doing. This is an increasing group of people. We often make fun of them on the show, but once again, everyone has made very clear these people exist who aren't interested in those parts of labels. So I think what you should do is think about organizing folks such as yourself. I have it on good authority that the Eric Adams campaign was actually really excited when the conservative New York Post endorsed them because that is exactly the type of endorsement that gets voters such as yourself on board in that situation. So I think the more important thing you should focus on is less the fact that you're a Republican or a conservative and more of that you're dissatisfied with both parties. And that's something you actually share in common with your fellow Brooklyn denizens. Of course, I am much in the same boat as you are in that context. Next question. Ooh, this is a this is a doozy from David, but we're gonna we're gonna go with it. Classical liberal and libertarian thought presupposes a limited capacity of private entities to frustrate market mechanisms that correct a slew of problems, pricing assets, allocating capital, etc., as a basis to advocate for a limited government role in the market. With the rise of artificial intelligence, the control of free speech by tech giants, and the agency capture of our government, it is foreseeable that an entity, not the government, will arise that can sidestep many of the organic correctives we've relied upon in place of regulation in the past. If you approach this hypothetical as a doctrinaire libertarian or classical liberal, what can be done? Does such a problem require a reformulation of those ideologies or the idea of limited government in the workplace? I'll begin by translating this question because it's a very, very interesting question. Basically, what David, who is attending the realignment conference, by the way, so David, thank you for this very wonky question that we'll definitely talk about you with in Miami. What David is suggesting is if you're a libertarian or a conservative, a lot of the reasons for believing there's no need to regulate certain industries or there's no need for government to take a bigger role in our society is this idea that, hey, 
there is a knowledge problem. There's not, there isn't a technocrat who knows everything, so I don't have to fear a government bureaucracy that can just control everything. Or this idea that, hey, actually, the market will correct for whatever problem that happens, therefore, there's no need for the government to step in. What David is suggesting is it's actually possible to envision a world where artificial intelligence could actually correct for many of these problems that libertarians have traditionally taken for granted as preventing too much big government. So for example, if you look at the Soviet Union, the example libertarians will always give you is the Soviets could never decide we need to produce 20 million rivets for automobiles this year because there used to be a dude in some Soviet workplace who would come up with that number and they would always get it wrong. So David's point is it's possible to actually imagine in let's say the 2020s or 2030s or even 2050s, a AI that could say, actually, we need 20 million rivets. It's that simple Blah, 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 blah. So I'll just answer the question real quick. Yeah, I think the question that you're getting at is one which we're really interested in the realignment, which is, hey, a lot of ideologies don't really meet the challenges or what's actually going on in the 21st century, and we should all update them accordingly. We shouldn't let ideologies or labels or specific policy sets that may have come into being before we were even born dictate how we approach new things. We should look at things from the 80s in one way, look at things in the 2020s in the other. What about you, Sagar? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question, but really what it comes down to, not only in terms of what you said, but also, yeah, you may be able to figure out the amount of rivets, but look, this is basically cliche at this point when we're talking about AI, but AI is only as good as the assumptions that we program within. And kind of what you're presuming is that, yeah, we could solve a certain amount of computational problems, but there are always going to be other problems around trade-offs, around geopolitics, around human-human interactions, which are probably just going to remain unsolvable by AI within our lifetime. So I think the same principle applies. This is from Andrew. Hi, Marshall and Sager. When I listen to the journalists that are critical of the U.S. government, a powerful tool I've heard being used to uncover important documents are FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests. It's limited for sure, but it can yield good results for investigative work. For years, I thought it would be great to be able to use such a FOIA-like law to target private companies by independent journalists to increase accountability. The fact that conversations within private companies that impact the public go under reported for decades in this country where people can react, such as Exxon's intention cover-up and disinformation campaign around global warming is appalling. It definitely goes against notions of an open society, in my opinion. I guess my question is, why doesn't this kind of solution get talked about seriously, especially when anti-corruption is, is on people's minds these days? Is the problem just too big to solve? FOIA has a national security exceptions, so a private sector equivalent wouldn't necessarily just become an IP intellectual property stealing law. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, it's a good idea, but here's the thing, man. We basically already have this. So, for example, if you sue a company for wrongdoing in the discovery process, you can subpoena all of the documents and re relevant correspondence that we have. For example, if a journalist is going to sue some company in the similar thing, the discovery process is going to yield all of what you want. That's how we already have internal emails from a lot of these companies that are floating around, not to mention the FTC and others, whenever they're going after companies for doing anti-competitive practices, they're able to subpoena internal documents. So I think that you're just trying to solve a problem, which frankly has already been solved under US law that we have right now. Yeah, well, this gets to a broader conversation we've had around issues like content moderation, Section 230, free speech, et cetera. There's just a difference between the public and the private sector. And like Sagar said, in the public sector, because it's literally the public, it makes sense to have a law that says, hey, you as a journalist, independent or legacy media, there doesn't have to be a distinction there, can get information about matters that pertain to the public. But that just doesn't quite apply to the private sector. And I don't entirely see a need for it, especially as Sagar said, in the sense that you can sue for things if there's damage. So I think the thing to think about is why is the system actually not working relative to the things that's actually frustrating about all of this? This is from the Apple Podcast Review. It is Speak For Myself. A lot of what you talk about on the show is centered around a political realignment, but an idea you often come back to is how politics is downstream from culture. One of the biggest contributors and recipients of culture is, of course, the education and schooling system. Where do you place education and schooling in the context of the realignment? 
And while the problems at the university level are obvious, here I'm actually wondering about high school and below. I'm interested in your thoughts and thanks for the pod. Quick questions to consider. Do you largely see schools as contributing to or suffering from the fractured nature of society? And if you're in charge of fixing the system, would you emphasize decentralization so school could return to being the focal points of the community? Or would you favor a more centralized effort to reconstruct shared values? What challenges or opportunities you see in the space going forward? Lots of stuff to work with. This is a good question and I actually really appreciate how you separated out the college from the high school dynamic. I'm not quite sure if I have a specific take, so I'll just comment on different parts. I appreciate how you set up the different questions. So one, I'd say that, look, especially for industrialized top tier economies like the US, the US has an incredibly decentralized education system in the first place. The local school board the city, the state, these different systems are incredibly decentralized relative to Western Europe, relative to East Asia. So that makes a very unique contribution here. And I'm not quite sure how you could be more decentralized than you are today. Obviously, there are things like Common Core and the SAT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But those are systems that are chosen within this decentralized system. So the decision to use them doesn't actually speak to how separated things are. But I'd also add too, though, that the realignment is driven by education in the sense that educational attainment and where people choose to move, where people choose to live are going to play a huge role in resorting our political coalition. So upper middle class suburbs, the differences between people who homeschool, all of those bits are going to make a big difference, though I can't quite say what I'd recommend. The last thing I would add is that I do appreciate your interesting point that I need to think more about around getting to where we need to go probably requires more centralization than most people suggest. So for example, if you're a traditional conservative, the way to change the system is probably not going to be saying, hey, let's just break everything up. There's probably going to have to be some type of consensus that's pushed from the top. Um, but what's soccer pick up here? Well, I think that was the whole, most hilarious part that I found around the critical race theory debate is that the people that I have seen say defund and destroy the education department are now like showing up to school boards and actually caring and discovering the utility of a centralized authority that has control over education over a number of students there and then taking it up to the state level and changing textbooks and more. And soon, if there is a Republican government again, we are almost certainly going to see some anti-CRT thing that is pushed within the DOE, which goes to show you that it becomes a fight over the type of resources. And look, I actually don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that some more in centralization educational polarization and more, the really only way that we can get past that is to have a shared set of assumptions. Now, the problem though, is that those assumptions derive not just from education, they come from geography and they come from culture and they come from where we grow up. And as the, we increasingly move and live away from one another, that is gonna be very difficult. And what the answer to that, I truly just don't know. That is an excellent place to leave. I know that we did not answer every single question ever, but the good news is we're going to continue to answer the ones we've gotten already on our Substack. We sent one out today, so be sure to check that out. We really appreciate how much thought everyone is putting on this, and we're definitely going to find ways to reformat this, keep things tight, but still bring in audience participation. It's a really important part of the show. Um, and I just want to do a quick thing to everyone who's still listening. We are recording this on Thursday the 19th, and I was just blown away at the reception to the episode with Dan, with General Dan Bolger. It's going to be other than the episode with Eric Weinstein the day after January 6th. It's going to be our biggest episode ever, and that's kind of surprising, but it's not surprising. There's a reason why we booked him for our season premiere, but seriously, I love the feedback. Keep it coming. We're going to be really aggressive on topics this season, really focused. The best responses I've gotten so far are folks saying, hey, this is what I was looking for to understand what things are going, to understand what's going on. And that's what we're looking to do. Like, If I'm thinking about the ambitions for the podcast over the next year, and I'd love to hear your ambition, Sagar, I want people to stop saying we're this like conservative or centristy thing and just treat us more like a platform. Treat us as a place where, hey, 
I'm seeing this crazy thing happen in Afghanistan. Who are two dudes I trust to help me understand how that's going by being devil's advocates, by being deep thinkers? That's what I want to do. And I think we really achieved that this episode. Yeah, I'm always mystified by the conservative one. It's been pretty clear this hasn't been a conservative podcast for like over a year. I mean, I've literally self-identified as politically homeless, so it's not really sure where a lot of that comes from. I often see people online attacking me as some sort of like toady of the right, and I'm like, you should tell the right because a lot of them hate me right now because they know that I'm not one of them. I always think these uh, these things are always fascinating. Look, my career on Breaking Points on here is just talking to people, and the entire thing is, is I I don't care what you are and what you believe or not. Definitely have a perspective. Sometimes it identifies with the political right, sometimes with the political left. I just want to be a guy who you can trust that I'm doing my best in order to tell you what I actually think. And I think that's really what the two of us are trying to do here. Could not say it better myself. Well, thank you for joining in, everyone. We've got great episodes coming up the rest of the season. Be sure to join in and we look forward to hearing and seeing all of you. That's it for now. 